Our lives are a gift from God. He entrusted us with this gift for a reason, and He has a divine destiny in store for each of us, a divine purpose for how our lives will unfold. And while we can always trust in God and His plan for us, we also have a special responsibility, and that's to be good stewards of these lives for the glory of God. God calls us to be good stewards over our health, our time, our talents, and our skills. And he calls us to be good stewards of our resources, our money, and our spiritual gifts. God calls us to be good stewards of the environment, of animals, and other people in our lives. All life, including each of ours, and this world, ultimately belongs to God. He has simply entrusted us to be good stewards of his beautiful creation. And by being good stewards, we show God just how much we love him and how grateful we are to him for every gift and every grace he has delivered to us. This week on Relentless Hope, Dr. Kent Ingle, president of Southeastern University, teaches us about becoming good stewards of our lives. After being told by his doctor that he had sugar diabetes, Kent was determined and committed to becoming a better steward of his own life including his health, his resources, his time, his skills, and his family. In part one, our life segment, we learn how Kent embraced self-discipline, which he says is the same as stewardship, and how he learned to systematically manage his life. As Kent says, when we become good stewards of our lives, it prepares and positions us to live the divine design God has in store for us. In part two, our leadership segment, Kent teaches us that to be a good leader, we must be good stewards over our lives, other people, and our calling. And he teaches us some of the key disciplines we can use to become better stewards and better leaders. In part three, our legacy segment, we hear how Kent is working to leave a legacy with everyone he meets by helping them to know in their hearts that God has created each of us and wired us to do something very special with our lives. Nothing that we've been given in this life is really ours. Not our homes, not our money, not our health, not our children, not even ourselves. Everything in this world belongs to God, and He has entrusted us to take great care of everything. What an awesome responsibility He has given to us. It's one to never take lightly, but to honor, cherish, and respect as God's good, faithful stewards. One of the most traumatic events in Dr. Kent Ingalls' life came when he received a call about his sister and her husband after a local event. Both were youth pastors at a church. They had taken a group of students to a local event and had dropped them off at the church and were on their way home. And before they turned off the highway, a drunk driver hit them head on and killed them instantly. My sister was my only sibling and it was a, it was a terrible tragedy. I had just come home from the television station where I uh, had anchored the 11 p.m. sports segment when all of a sudden I received this horrible phone call about my sister and her uh, husband and their catastrophic deaths. It hurt worse than anything I had experienced up to that point in my life. On part one of this three-part series, we learn about the stewardship of life from Dr. Kent Engel the president of Southeastern University out of Lakeland, Florida. After spending 10 years as a television sports anchor for NBC and CBS, 
Dr. Kent Ingle now educates students for a Christ-centered life. He talks about the importance of preparation, exhibiting courage, and how he makes a difference in people's lives. I remember a major incident in my life happened years ago. I had a wake-up call. I remember my doctor sitting me down and saying, Kent, you have sugar diabetes, and it's bad. And that's not what I expected to hear. I, I knew I was overweight, but I never thought my health and my life were in danger. My blood sugar count was over 350 milligrams per deciliter. And as a reference, the normal range before meals is around 100 milligrams per deciliter. I was 250 too high. And I'll never forget, the doctor's words kind of rippled through my mind. I was a ticking time bomb. According to the Mayo Clinic, high blood sugar can cause heart attack, stroke, vision problems, nerve damage, kidney problems, gum disease. I mean, I was on a fast track to one or more of these debilitating conditions. How did I get there and what was I going to do about it? I knew there were short-term solutions to the problem, but I wanted more than that. I, I didn't want to become dependent on medications to manage my irresponsibility. I needed to become more self-disciplined if I was going to win the battle against my own bad habits. I was kind of stuck in a dangerous cycle that could eventually kill me. Something had to change, and the change had to be permanent. So my aha moment, I'll never forget, had far-reaching repercussions. I started thinking about the stewardship of life and how it was my responsibility to really manage everything God has entrusted to me. That includes my health, but also my time and my talents and resources and influence, leadership, family, and so many other components of life. You know, I never planned to be irresponsible regarding my health. It kind of just happened over time when I failed to pay attention to what was really important. And here's the thing. You know, life can't be separated into disconnected silos because the parts are all linked together. And that might not seem like a deep spiritual truth, and honestly, it's not deep, but it is foundational. And life really is interconnected, and we all have the responsibility to manage it according to God's divine design. And leadership is all about faithfully exercising our minds, bodies, influence, in fact, all that God has given us. Nowhere in the Bible does God command a lack of discipline. Nowhere in the Bible does God tell us that we are better able to serve Him when we let our habits take control of our lives. That's not in the Bible, but it's how many of us live, and I know because I've tried it. You know, when we understand how interconnected life is, we recognize the importance of discipline. And I really consider discipline to be the systematic management of your life to prepare and position you for your divine design. Discipline and stewardship are one and the same. You see, discipline brings order to life, and it's absolutely required if we're going to be good stewards of the call to leadership. But here's what we have to consider. You know, we have to pay a price to get to the next level of any pursuit in life. I think about millions of high school students. They, you know, they participate in sports every year, but only a small fraction of them ever make it to the collegiate level or to the professional level. You need more than just natural talent. You know, making it to the next level requires dedication. It requires determination. It requires discipline. For leaders, this truth is always present. When my whole life is in order, things come into alignment. And if I'm learning and growing, I won't have to fear getting stuck. I'll experience the truth of Romans 12, 2, where Paul says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, and it will be good, pleasing, and perfect. And the Greek word translated renewing actually, I think, derives from the word that means renovate. And if you watched, you know, a home improvement show, you've seen renovation at work. Professionals go into a home and they decide what to keep, what to reuse, what to replace. I think God does the same thing. God begins transforming our thought processes. We allow him to renovate our lives. He shows us what to keep, what to reuse, what to replace. That's how the Holy Spirit works. When the notion of becoming more self-disciplined hit me, though, I, I didn't need to add something to, to my to-do list. I needed a complete renovation. I needed God to change the way I thought because every action is preceded by a mental process. When my thinking is aligned with God's principles, my actions have a better chance of aligning with Him. And that's what I wanted, but I knew it wouldn't you know, happen if I didn't take action. And this wasn't the first time I encountered my own faulty thinking, and honestly, it won't be the last. 
I think faulty thinking is at the core of many things that we accept as normal today. If we aren't allowing, you know, the Holy Spirit to continually renovate our minds, we're going to follow, you know, what's going on in the world. We're going to follow cultural trends to co- to compromise our really our unique divine design and our calling. Now, I, I can tell you this, I don't claim to have all the answers, but I knew I do know what God has been doing in my own life. And I know his divine design for each of us is to live amazing lives that give us a sense of meaning and purpose while drawing attention to his grace, and to his love. You can't fulfill God's destiny without discipline in your life. I'll talk a little bit more about discipline in uh, a little bit later, but I can tell you this, no matter how much internal discipline you have, there will be circumstances that you find yourself in that you can't manage or control. And I can honestly say that the most difficult situation I have ever endured wasn't scare of diabetes, but the death of my sister and her husband. Both were youth pastors at a church. They had taken a group of students to a local event and had dropped them off at the church and on their way home, and before they turned off the highway, a drunk driver hit them head on and killed them instantly. My sister was my only sibling, and it was a it was a terrible tragedy. I had just come home from a television station where I uh, had anchored the 11 p.m. sports segment when all of a sudden I received this horrible phone call about my sister and her um, husband and their catastrophic deaths. It hurt worse than anything I had experienced up to that point in my life. And but I can tell you this, this tragedy began a deep process of self-reflection. I began to think about investing in people. Specifically, I wanted to come alongside people and help them grow in their faith. So nearly 10 years after I began my journey in sports television, I felt I needed to leave my behind my career in that and begin maybe a new journey in ministry leadership. It seemed that Ministry leadership would give me an opportunity to make a difference in people's lives, more than even what I was doing in the sports industry. At this point in life, I found myself kind of in the need of additional education. Specifically, I needed to pursue um, leadership training, theological training. So I began to pursue a degree that covered those aspects, that covered kind of, you know, church history, uh, biblical studies, um, you know, covered practical leadership, uh, and that helped my journey, again, to to step into this next role of what I believe God put into my life, that divine design, um, so that I could grow as a leader and step into what he had for me next. Um, I can tell you my learning, even now in the role that I have, hasn't been limited, you know, it's not limited to just formal education. I think it also has to do with mentors. And so I remember when I became president of Southeastern University, I sought out mentors like John Wallace, the president of Azusa Pacific University. And, you know, he began to help me understand what it's like to lead a, um, a university and, and to lead a setting where you're, you know, coming alongside providing higher education that integrates faith, learning, and life to students I begin to help me understand, you know, the potential for organization and leading transformational change. Um, I remember when I was young and and in in high school, my pastor um, took time to mentor me, uh, Pastor Fred Cottrell. He guided me through the discovery of my divine design and so many others that played important roles in my education. I remember years later, I was pastoring a church in Chicago when I first was approached with the idea of moving into higher education, a path I had never thought about up to that point. Things were going extremely well, you know, where I was pastoring at the church I was leading. Uh, When I had arrived at the church, it was in desperate need of a turnaround. And after years of hard work and determination, things had finally begun to change and the church was growing. We were in a good place. I had no reason to look for another ministry opportunity when I received that unexpected phone call. When I picked up the f- the phone, the person on the other end had ex- you know explained that my name had been given to him as a possible candidate for the role of the dean of the College of Ministry at Northwest University in Seattle, Washington. The one who had recommended me was actually on the search committee. He also happened to be a part of my doctoral committee and had overseen my completion of that program. This individual told the committee he knew 
a particular person with the right gifts, skills, passions, interests to do what was needed to be done at Northwest University. The university wanted to turn around their college of ministry and everything I had done up to that point in my own ministry and my own leadership had been about turning difficult situations into opportunities for growth and expansion. So there was an element of this opportunity that was, you know, very familiar to me. And as I considered this move, I, I realized just how much it fit my divine design. Higher education wasn't on my radar screen, yet it seemed like a natural step uh, that would be next in my life. And uh, after much consideration and prayer, my wife and I decided to accept the opportunity. We left Chicago and moved northwest to take on this new leadership assignment. You know, these peculiar moments happen to everyone, but not everyone recognizes them for what they are. Many simply see them as passing fragments of a puzzle rather than seeing them as an opportunity embedded in possibility. You know, they rec they, what they do is they redirect their attention to the task and obligations at hand. There's several reasons why many uh, choose to just walk away from life's invitation to really an adventure that God has. But I can tell you this, doing so always will take you further from what God does have planned, the way He designed you, the way He created you, the way He made you. When I became president of Southeastern University, I knew I was stepping into an entirely different culture. I had grown up and lived the majority of my life on the West Coast. You know, California was my home. If you've ever spent time there, you know it's a unique place. And you know, you won't find places like the Sierra Nevada mountains or Venice Beach anywhere else in the world. And Southeastern isn't on the West Coast. No, it's on the opposite side of the country. And I knew I was in a different place from the moment I arrived. Experiencing something different always creates a certain level of anxiety. There are new customs, new pronunciations, new traditions. I also knew that by stepping into this role at Southeastern, I was following a giant personality who had achieved significant things for the school. The former president had been extremely successful, well-liked, respected. To be honest, it was a little intimidating. It's never easy for a leader to follow someone like my predecessor. I would have to cut my own path, but I would also have to work through the established expectations of others. This transition also came with a great deal of confirmation, walking into that office for the first time. I could see how all the dots in my life had connected and prepared me for this new role. But it would never have happened if I hadn't stepped out to accept this opportunity, one I hadn't been looking for, but it, but it would have been a mistake not to consider it. Every transition, I think, in life requires several things. I think it requires faith, it requires courage, conviction, it requires preparation. As you're on your journey, I think one last thing that's very important that, that I mention is, is this value of preparation. People who are on a journey have a deep restlessness within their souls. They're usually not satisfied with the, th the way things are. Instead, they're reaching for something that is yet to be. We have to push ourselves to do our very best in everything. And I call it the stewardship of life. I'm not suggesting people on a journey are necessarily unhappy. In fact, I think oftentimes the opposite is true. I have yet to meet someone who lives with a sense of purpose and mission who doesn't also have a healthy view of life. Life is exciting when you watch every day unfold to reveal another aspect, really, of the masterpiece God is creating from your life. Preparation helps us gain the skills, disciplines, perspectives we need to complete, I think, the next phase of our journey. Sometimes the situation and complexities you face today are hard to understand or connect to a larger purpose, but nothing happens in life by accident. Every experience, good and bad, is really part of how you're shaped, molded, crafted into a force of change in the world. We must never forget that we are always on a mission that God has designed for our lives. Formal education is one of the basic types of preparation. I think it includes primary, secondary, college, graduate, postgraduate studies. Well, I you know, would be the first to admit that our natural, um, you know, and and kind of, well, I, I guess it might be even a national approach to formal education could be improved. There is something to be said for maintaining the integrity of the classical process. The primary objective of a classical approach to education is not so much to teach 
a skill is to train the student to think critically, to write effectively, to communicate persuasively. The world is changing faster than most in institutions, I think, can, can adapt. And this is a glaring reality that plagues not only the academic community, but also the business community. It, it plagues really our culture. To achieve agility, we must be able to pivot in a variety of directions, adapt quickly to change. And this is what education has done so well for so long. I think another type of education that helps us in preparation is real-world experience. Nothing can replace the skills, expertise, and perspective gained from achieving results. Even if our efforts result in failure, I think we can still learn from all these valuable lessons in our lives. Various jobs I've held over the years have provided insight I wouldn't have had otherwise. They've connected me to networks of people I might never have met. They've opened doors that would not have been accessible to me. Personal disciplines are, a, are very much a part of preparation. If we don't exhibit good financial management, debt might prevent us from saying yet to an, you know, yes to another exciting opportunity. If we don't take care of our bodies, poor health might prevent us from completing a transition or taking on a demanding role. If we don't prepare our hearts and minds through spiritual disciplines, we might not understand the significance of the subtle shifts in our lives. You know, a final type of preparation I, I think is so important in life is mentorship. There was a time in our culture when being an apprentice shadowed a professional and learned the knowledge and skills of a trade or a profession while gaining you know, on-the-job experience. And this type of preparation can't be transferred to a classroom. A variety of people have mentored me over the years, and I'm grateful they took the time to pour themselves into my life. And those mentors made me realize how important it is to invest in others. Currently, I get to come alongside students at Southeastern University, and I want to provide a context for their education that will you know, help them transfer valuable classroom lessons into the professional world and beyond. For me, you know, preparation, like the process of discovering your divine design, doesn't have a defined beginning and an end, but it's always going to be perpetual. Moving through this phase doesn't mean we take a time out from life until we're ready to jump in again. I think that would severely undercut the balance of theory and practice needed to prepare us for what's ahead. You know, when I graduated from high school, I had a good sense of the things I was passionate about. I loved communications. I loved investing in people. However, I had no idea how this would play out in my life. I remember I, I had decided to attend the local community college to get some general education courses out of the way and, of course, to save some money. I hope to find a little bit of clarity about what, you know, university, uh, you know, I should attend, what major I should pursue. And while I was at that community college, I, I took a, a, a course. After my, uh, it was a speech class, after my first speech in front of the class, the professor asked me to meet, meet uh, uh, in her office. And, and in that meeting, she said, Kent, I, 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 you did a great job on your speech. And and she said, in fact, it was so well done. I, I really believe you have a gift for public speaking. And she, uh, she wanted to help me get exposure in the communications field. Um, and so she, she said, I think I can help you. And if you're interested in possibly uh, making this as a career, um, I, I can begin to help chart a course for you. She told me about an internship opportunity at a local television station. It was an easy decision in my mind uh, because what she told me is, is this was the local NBC affiliate and and uh, they had an internship availability and and uh, I can help you get it. And so she did. I landed the internship position and the news director asked me about that particular assignment, where I would like to uh, focus. And I said, well, I love sports. So, you know, uh, I'd love to work with the sports anchor. And and so the news director put me right with the sports anchor, and, and I began to uh, learn from him. I, he, he taught me how to write scripts, capture video, edit, prepare, uh, um, produce each broadcast. He taught me everything I needed to know to be a great sports anchor. I'll never forget about three months into the internship, the, uh, he was offered an, another job in the San Francisco area, and he accepted that job, and all of a sudden his position was vacant. And I saw an opportunity, and I, I immediately went into the news director's office, and, and I said, hey, uh, 
you know, you've been watching me, you've been observing me. In fact, you've been my teacher in many ways. And, and so I just said, hey, would you give me a chance to, you know, try out for this job? I explained that I feel like I knew everything I needed to know to do the work. Sure enough, he gave me an opportunity to produce a segment, deliver it on camera, use the, the set there in the, in the studios. Um, it wasn't live television, but it was as close to being live as it gets. He observed the entire segment, hired me on the spot, and that began my 10-year career in sports television. You see, my preparation had positioned me for that opportunity. When I started to work in broadcasting, I was just 18 years of, of age. Didn't have a lot of experience, but to tell you the truth, I had a lot of rough edges, but I was willing to learn, to do just about anything, to try everything at least once. I absorbed as much as I could from interactions from a wide variety of people and preparations. This positioned me to make my next move. And then I remember when I transitioned into ministry, I needed more knowledge in things like theory, church, history, biblical study. So I went back to to pursue, again, more formal education in these areas. Again, helping me uh, prepare to lead a congregation. My preparation to leave local church ministry and move into academic, um, you know, uh, into an academic environment looked different once again. And again, I remember seeking out various university presidents to spend time with them, to learn from them, and to use what I learned from them to shape my ideas and vision. I've learned the value of mentoring others because people have mentored me. And that's why even today, I have a group of people who mentor me, who advise me and guide me through the twists and turns of life. And as you can tell from my story, preparation is not limited to what happens inside the four walls of a classroom or a home or even an office. It's a combination of various factors that, you know, begin to provide a cumulative effect that, you know, make a huge impact on our individual designs. There's something you need to know. If you haven't already picked up on it, every phase of the decision-making process in our lives require that we have something behind that we have to leave. Our minds are powerful instruments that can cloud the way we see the world around us. We filter out what we don't want to see, hear, or believe. This often functions as a coping mechanism to various stress points. And make no mistake about it, change is stressful. Preparation phase will reveal that we must leave behind before we can continue on our journey. And we're going to have to discover what we need to leave behind so we can move forward. Some may need to leave behind faulty assumption, assumptions about other people, ways of living, or even ideas about what's impossible or what's possible. We tend to gravitate towards what is familiar and known, and this is heavily influenced by how and where we grew up. Sometimes our assumptions about people and situations will hold us back from possibilities that we can't see. Some may need to leave behind the sting of failure. We, we aren't very old when we learn that a red-hot iron will burn our hands if we touch it. Same is true in life. It's possible to reach out and touch a red-hot iron without necessarily knowing we did so. That burn can leave deep scars that prevent us from moving forward on our journey. Some may need to leave behind the you know, the actual glory of success. It's amazing to watch leaders walk away from successful situations to pursue new opportunities. Why would they do that? Perhaps because they understand that to rest in the success of today is to place their hope and faith in a period of time and set of circumstances that is constantly changing. Our security comes from remaining actively engaged in the process that is shaping us today. There's no part of preparation that doesn't ask us to leave something behind in order to take something new. It can be an idea, an assumption, a skill, or a perspective. If we want to grow, we have to break free from what is today so we can embrace a new way of thinking. Preparation is the glue that will keep you grounded through the chaos of change. It's also going to keep you from losing sight of who God designed you to be. You're a specific solution to a unique problem in this world. And moving through the preparation phase will always ensure you're ready to live in your divine design. As a leader, you have to take time to sharpen your axe. You must continually hone your skills, steward your gifts, expand your thinking, increase your resources, empower your team, search for new trends to avoid you know, plateauing, declining. Um, a 
A well-prepared leader develops new growth before prior success runs out. And learning how to steward yourself through the disciplines of self-awareness, self-management, self-preparedness, I think are the, you know, they're foundational for leadership. Discovering or reinforcing these ideas is really the beginning of reaching your next level as a leader. And again, leadership will always start with you. On part two of this three-part series, Dr. Kent Engel explains that becoming a true leader first starts with leading yourself. He explains the three areas for stewarding your life and achieving next level leadership. We learn about the significance of taking advantage of our gifts, sharpening our skills, and how to complete our divine destiny. You know, at the end of the day, leadership, I think, is all about stewardship. We have all been given a divine design, the God-ordained purpose for our lives. And realizing this purpose as a leader, I think, requires proper stewardship of our lives. Uh, your divine design is God's gift to you. And how you steward your life, when you think about it, is really your gift to God. The tools for stewarding your life are known as disciplines. Discipline is any systematic management of different spheres of your life to prepare and position you to really capture how God made you. The most successful leaders in the world don't try to accomplish everything. Instead, they discipline themselves to steward the right things. And I've always believed true success in leadership is found in learning what to say yes to and really what to say no to. And I think there are three key areas for stewarding your life that that I think help you to be the leader that God calls you to be. And I know in my own life, these have been profound um, areas that have helped me in, in life stewardship, the stewardship of self, the stewardship of others, and the stewardship of calling. Stewardship of these areas, I think, uh, are absolutely essential for reaching next level leadership. And I truly believe that prop by properly stewarding these areas and by implementing these disciplines, I think you'll be well prepared to continue pursuing that divine journey that God has for you, that divine destiny that is ahead of you. When you think about the stewardship of self, that's the first one that I think is important. I'm, I'm a firm believer that you can't lead out of what you don't have. Leaders who project well-roundedness yet neglect inward flaws will in, inevitably, I think, slip up. Without self-stewardship, it's a matter of time until you run out of steam. Authentic leadership stems from healthy stewardship of self. In fact, leadership always starts with you. First person you must be able to lead is yourself. I think this involves taking care of your body, your mind, your soul, your relationships. I call this the discipline of self-management. As I have shared over and over uh, in my life, uh, an incident that has occurred, I, I remember again uh, the doctor startling me with the words that you have sugar diabetes and it's bad. And I still remember those words as they ripple through my mind. Uh, high blood sugar, again, can cause heart attack, stroke, vision problems, nerve damage, kidney problems, other serious issues. And basically I was that ticking time bomb. I had two choices, either continue being a one dimensional leader or introduce self-management into areas that I was ignoring. I needed to win the battle against my own bad habits. I needed to get out of, you know, that dangerous cycle that could eventually kill me. And this realization transformed more than my diet and workout routine. It challenged me to approach my time my talents, resources, influence, leadership, my family through a disciplined lifestyle. And if any part of our self-management is out of sync, it can have a drastic consequence you know, on other aspects of our life. Life balance is key to, I think, well-rounded, enduring, and effective leadership. I think another area of, of life stewardship is this area of, of the discipline of self-awareness. I think it was Benjamin Franklin who said, experience is the best teacher, but you can't learn anything from an experience unless you're aware. And awareness comes by disciplining ourselves to reflect on our experiences, whatever those experiences might be, good, difficult, bad, you know, ministry, spiritual. I think some key self-awareness questions that you have to ask yourself when reflecting on the experiences you go through life or how, how challenging 
uh, has this experience been in my life? You know, what was the Im- impact of the experience on my life, on the people around me? And then what, what did I learn from this experience? I, those, those questions seem to help me really, truly reflect on what's going on in my life. The answer to these questions, I think, give you a, a awareness of your most important asset as a leader, your giftings. I think inspection of what gifts you have, working with within your gifts, allows you and those, I think, you lead to work together better. We work outside of our gifting, at least two people suffer, you and the person who really should be doing that task. As a leader, you have the responsibility to take advantage of your gifts, to empower those you lead to use theirs as well. I think another great discipline in, in, in the stewardship of life is the discipline of self-preparedness. Future always favors those who are prepared. I like the story of, uh, uh, of a young man who once approached a logging crew foreman and he, he, asked, he asked for a job. Uh, let's, uh, you know, see you chop down this tree, the foreman said to him. The young man stepped forward and took down a large tree and impressed the foreman and said, you can start on Monday. And so the young man reported to work faithfully each day, but on Thursday afternoon, the foreman went to the young man and said, you can pick up your paycheck on the way out today. The young man was surprised and asked, don't we get paid on Friday? Well, yes, we do, replied the foreman, but, but I'm letting you go because you've fallen behind. Our productivity charts show that you've dropped from first place on Monday to last place today. Well, I'm the hardest worker here, objected, you know, Young man, I I arrived first, leave last, and even worked through my breaks. The foreman could see the young man's insincerity and see how passionate he was. Hesitated for a moment and asked, But have you been sharpening your axe? The young man stood quietly and said, Well, no, sir, I've been working too hard to take time for that. Well, that story reminds me as a leader, you have to take time to sharpen your acts. You must continually hone your skills, steward your gifts, expand your thinking, increase your resources, empower your team, search for new trends to avoid, you know, plateauing, declining. Um, A well-prepared leader develops new growth before prior success runs out. And learning how to steward yourself through the disciplines of self-awareness, self-management, self-preparedness, I think are the, you know, they're foundational for leadership. Discovering or reinforcing these ideas is really the beginning of reaching your next level as a leader. And again, leadership will always start with you. To go to the next level in your leadership, I think you you also have to, you know, steward well the people that God has placed in your life. I think it's important to look at disciplines that will help you develop what I call the stewardship of others. I think, first of all, that's important when you steward others is the discipline of character. You know, while self-management, self-awareness, self-preparedness dictate the person you're becoming, character, de- de- really, when you think about it, character determines the person you are. Many people think character affects only themselves. The truth is bad character kills your influence with others, where a strong character gives you credibility to begin leading. People expect leaders to have impeccable character, and if there isn't an underlying foundation of integrity that governs a leader's thoughts and actions, a life failure isn't too far off. This initial failure may not be the embezzlement of thousands of dollars, but it may begin as something as small as falsifying travel reimbursement requests. You know, people think, I, you know, I wasn't caught with this small step of dishonesty, and a slippery slope ensues. To engage in this discipline, you must continually ask yourself, Who am I really? Examine the things you think about, talk about, dream about, and act on. One thing to watch for is self-gratifying thoughts and actions. I think the dark side of leadership begins when we think we deserve something that isn't ours. You know, David, for example, in Scripture, enjoyed close fellowship with God, yet he gave in to so much self-gratification. Indulging one's selfish thought ultimately led him down a path towards adultery, deception, and murder. David's failure of character not only damaged himself personally, but it almost cost him his right to lead the people of Israel. The lesson of David is obvious. No one, absolutely no one, is immune to temptation. So we have to protect our character at all costs. 
I think when you steward others in your life, uh, it's the discipline of relationships that are absolutely important. You can't fulfill your divine design without relationships. God created you for relationships. It's the job of leaders not only to know the people they lead, but to empower them to embrace their divine designs. As a leader, you must be willing to discipline yourself to really step out of your comfort zone and then begin developing ways to grow relationships with others. Again, I'll never forget Pastor Fred Cottrell. He was my pastor at Bakersfield, California, First Assembly when I was a teenager. Pastor Cottrell was a true investing pastor, a servant mentor. I remember one Sunday morning after a church service, Pastor Cottrell told me that he had been observing my life. Pastor Cottrell believed God had placed gifts, talents, abilities in my life for future ministry leadership. He wanted to invest the time to mentor me. So at the age of 15, I began spending one day a week with Pastor Cottrell. He took me on hospital visitations, newcomer visits, he even taught me how he crafted weekly sermons. Remember, God created you to give, love, and serve others, just like Pastor Cottrell. Investing in relationships is what it's all about. Years later, when God opened the doors of ministry to me, what Pastor Cottrell had poured into my life actually made a huge difference in my ability to handle that call of God in my life. I still benefit from what he gave me through our relationship. Pastor Cottrell emphasized repeatedly that God designed each of us with intentional purpose. You know, as a leader, always be intentional in setting the tone in your dialogue and relationships to focus on others. Empowering others means you're not the object of the relationship at all. Don't design the conversations with the end goal of receiving praise, but instead remember to genuinely pour into people for their betterment, for their growth. I think the degree of trust others have in you dramatically affects the quality of your relationship. Relationships are the prerequisite for empowerment. I think also when you think about stewarding others, you have to understand the discipline of generosity. Generosity matters because God's blessings are not meant to flow to you. They should flow through you. If you're not prepared to be generous, you're going to miss out on the blessing of investing in others. A story about the results of generosity comes from the life experience of my wife's father. Like many others at the time, the Crace family, they were adjusting to life following World War II. Fortunately, a 16-year-old by the name of Glenn Crace landed a job as a soda barista at the Walgreens drugstore in Southside Chicago neighborhood. He had exceptional you know, interpersonal skills. He'd worked hard, showed promise for, far beyond the ability to make the perfect chocolate malt. And, and, and the store manager noticed Glenn. He noticed, um, you know, a lot of things about Glenn's life. He had discovered Glenn's family probably wouldn't be able to pay his way to college. And although Glenn had applied for college the summer after he graduated high school, a few weeks before Glenn was to start, his parents did tell him that he would not be able to attend because the money wasn't there. Then one week before he was to start college, Glenn received a postcard in the mail, and it said, Tuition, room, and board had been paid in full, and it was signed by the Walgreens Drug Company. And in fact, for the next eight semesters, he received a postcard in the mail saying the same thing. Glenn went on to earn his undergraduate degree and then graduated from the University of Illinois Pharmacy School. And all through college, Glenn worked at Walgreens and eventually decided that since the company had been generous to him, had invested in him, he would commit his professional life to the company. Glenn rose through the ranks over a 50-year career, from soda jerk to manager to district manager to regional manager and senior vice president. And then he spent the last 21 years with the company as the executive vice president of all store operations. You see, God created you to give love and serve others. His generosity should inspire us to be willing to give away everything we have and are. And that's hard to do in a culture that tells us to hold on to everything we get. But we must be disciplined uh, to release the things that God entrusts to us. We can do that when we realize everything belongs to God. 
you allow your character to guide you, the relationships you develop will make you a stronger, more trustworthy leader. When you discipline yourself to give mercy, forgiveness, encouragement, wisdom, and even finances to those with whom you've developed a relationship, your leadership will blossom. As a leader, the disciplines of character and relationships and generosity are how you steward the people God has placed in your life. I think a final area of stewardship that I think is so important in our life is the stewardship of calling. You know, once we've learned how to steward our lives and our interactions with others, we then begin to see our, how our lives are aligned with the calling that God has placed upon our life. Uh, as we'll see, only once um, uh, our lives are brought under proper alignment personally and relationally can we fully then begin to embrace that call that God has for us. You know, earlier I discussed how the discipline of self-awareness and self-management and self-preparedness, you know, resulted in proper stewardship of our own lives. But the second of area, I think the second area of stewardship, the stewardship of others, blossoms when we discipline our character, manage our relationships, and be, you know, it's when we're generous with people. But again, once we've done these things, we can focus on, I think, the disciplines that make up the stewardship of calling. And I think one of the key disciplines um, in the stewardship of calling is the discipline of learning. I think the discipline of learning is the foundation for following our calling. A posture of learning allows us to live, you know, in a way that adapts to what's going on in our context. If we aren't intentional about lifelong learning, we will lose our relevance and squander the opportunities God places in front of us. As the 21st century moves at a dizzying rate, if we you know, refuse to uh, adapt to the changes around us. Uh, we lose the ability to reevaluate our lives and leadership skills in the context in which we live. And I think furthermore, we fail to improve in personal and relational areas in our life. We must cultivate an appetite to constantly learn in order to approach life's challenges and ways that, you know, address the needs uh, uh, around us when when we are prepared, we notice the opportunities to engage in the ever-changing world that we live in. I think another great discipline is the discipline of opportunity. Discipline of opportunity is where personal stewardship, relational maturity, and learning intersect. When you stay aware of what could be next, you're going to resist the natural tendency to grow stagnant and complacent. Years ago, when, when he first went to Southern California, um, I remember Rick Warren was considered by many to be a kind of a renegade. Uh, Though educated in a traditional environment, his entrepreneurial approach to ministry at that time was very controversial. In fact, some people resisted Warren's approach because they always resist anything that doesn't resonate with the past. Others resisted because they didn't want Warren to prove that a different way to do things might not only work, but might be widely successful. So some people, very few, cheered him on, and ultimately Saddleback Church was born and, of course, has become a standard bearer and game changer in the church community. I think his passion, his perseverance, his resourcefulness, open-mindedness, and awareness enabled him to respond to the opportunities of his context. And I think in the same way, these entrepreneurial tendencies will prepare you to recognize and respond to the aha moments that I think come your way. An active entrepreneurial approach will help you connect the dots and see opportunities as they develop. The more you do this, the more you will see your God-given divine design in action. And such leaders, I think, are prepared to engage the opportunities that arise. And then I think last is, is the discipline of missional living. The opportunities you act on should naturally mesh with your sense of mission and purpose. And this is the discipline of missional living. The more clearly you understand your mission, the better prepared you will be to make decisions. One word that will change your life, a book written by John Gordon, Dan Britton, and Jimmy Page, is, a, I think, a valuable resource to help focus on, the, on, on, on one element of your life. I've used their one word process to help me live, I I know, in my life mission. It was, in fact, in 2011, my one word mission was listening. I was determined to position myself to truly listen to God, my family, my colleagues, and so forth. 
listening was important because there were so many things in my life that needed God's direction and clarity. Out of that process came many of the principles and values that still guide our organization in my life today. In 2012, I actually had two words, courage and conviction. People who live with courage and conviction will see God do great things. In fact, the Bible's full of stories of people who had conviction and took action. Paul faced hostile situations, yet he never backed down. Jesus was stalked by the Pharisees and knew their power, but stuck to his convictions. Um, In the Old Testament, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood up to Nebuchadnezzar while realizing the king had the power to put them to death. The more I focused on courage and conviction, the more those qualities began to you know, develop and grow in my life. In 2013, um, it was all about intentional living. You know, everyone lives, but how many people live with a sense of purpose? And this was the question that motivated me to be more intentional, it required a keen sense of awareness and purpose. And I, I, I couldn't go through the motion of just doing life. I had to understand the value of the things I was doing. You know, we have to pay attention to the moments we have each day. We have to pay attention to the people in our life, to the whispers of God. You know, this is self-awareness, a discipline from the stewardship of self that enables us to live missionally. Every year since, God has given me a word for that year. And and again, it's all about living with purpose. And here's what I'm really trying to emphasize with all of this. Discipline keeps you on target. If we don't keep awareness of our context, we may end up living out someone else's mission. I love the book, Cazone, written by Craig Groeschel. It shares the story of what happened in the 2004 Summer Olympics with Matthew Emmons, um, one of our American athletes. He was on track for the gold in the 50-meter three-position rifle final, and Emmons was up for his final shot. He was so far ahead of the other competitors that all he had to do was, you know, fire a bullet, send that bullet anywhere through the inner ring of the target to seal winning the gold medal. So when that final shot came, he stepped up. He prepared himself mentally. He paused his breathing. He took aim. Pow! He fired the final shot. The bullet passed right through the bullseye. And he's ready to celebrate. He's got the gold. But he was puzzled when the tone indicating a hit didn't sound. Emmons then realized that the bullseye he had hit was on the wrong target. And he dropped from winning the gold medal to eighth place in the competition. The right shot hit the wrong target. Bottom line, one day, all of us, we're going to stand before the greater judge, the greatest judge of all, greater than any who was officiated at the Olympics. What will you say if he tells you that in your life you hit the wrong target? What if he says you weren't a good steward of his divine design? Hopefully you have disciplined your life well and hit the bullseye on the right target so that you can hear the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. If you're more interested in learning about these disciplines, feel free to check out the book, Nine Disciplines of Enduring Leadership, Developing the Potential of Your Divine Design. And and in that particular book, I go into much greater detail about these disciplines that will absolutely take your leadership to new levels, um, really fulfilling the call that God has for you in the context that he's placed you. He says this, he says, the place where God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger coincide. The place where God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger coincide. Basically, they come together. I want to help people discover that place where their specific passions can meet the world's unique needs. The only way they can do this is by learning how to create a framework for their life and having the discipline to live that framework out. On part three of this three-part series, we learn that in order to build a great legacy, 
and a great framework for your life, you have to clarify your goals. Dr. Kent Engel explains how he used unique listening exercises to understand what people want and ultimately what they really need. He tells us that everyone carries the imprint of God and how legacy has to be lived out by everyone we touch. Wow, when I think about legacy and, and how I want people to remember me, it all goes back to this idea of divine design. I'm so passionate about understanding how God you know, made you, created you, wired you. I, I want every person I come in contact with to learn this one simple idea that God has uniquely made you to do something special. I firmly believe that every person carries within them the imprint of God. Just as God is creative, you are creative. Just as God has a story to tell, so do you. You were put on earth to make a difference. What I want leaders to realize is that each one of you carry a central organizing principle. And as you discover and develop it, while wow, you begin to build a framework for accomplishing the vision God has placed in your heart. And if you can learn how to use your unique leadership framework, you'll always have complete control of your context that God has placed you in. I think, you know, the first step in developing your leadership framework is really to listen. Uh, as a leader, I want to be marked as a careful, attentive listener. I think too many leaders want to be known for what they say. I want to be known for what I hear. I'll never forget when I first met the faculty of Southeastern University, I was in the final stages of my interview process to be the president of the university. It had been a long, grueling day of interviews and, and uh, meeting the stakeholders, and now we're at a point where I was sitting in front of the entire faculty of the university. And the um, search committee made their introductions of me, and I gave my opening comments, the same routine I had done countless times already that day. Then they opened the floor for questions from the faculty. Right off the bat, I got hit with the question that everybody actually was asking all day long, what is your vision for the university? I had no idea at the time that my answer would mark actually my entire presidency and propel SEU to become, you know, one of the fastest growing universities in the nation. I think too many leaders want to lay out immediately what the vision is. They want to start out with, here's the vision. They feel that before they can start leading, they already have to know what to do and where to go. The problem with this mindset is that most of the time, reality falls short of their expectations. What a leader thinks their people need and what they actually need can be uh, totally different. And this is why all good leadership, ha that you have to start you know, your process of leading with listening. The potential of every organization lies in the potential of its people. Your people have hopes and dreams for their lives and for their roles in your organization. They also see threats, opportunities that you as a leader may not see. The one key idea I uh, want people to learn from my legacy is this, that good leadership will always start with listening to the people. And as I stood in front of the faculty during the interview, the question continued to hang in the air, what is your vision for the university? And of course, my answer might surprise you, but I looked at the faculty in that moment and I said, Honestly, I don't know. I knew that I couldn't answer that question. Until I had done my job as a listener, I could not shape my role as a leader. Before I could understand the vision, I would have to listen to the people. So that's what we did. We enacted what would become one of the largest, most in-depth listening exercises the university had ever conducted. From that listening exercise, we began to understand the culture of organization as well as the vision for the future. And that's why leading through frameworks always starts with listening. As leaders, we listen to our people. We begin to lay the foundations of trust on which we build our influence. That's why all leadership must start with listening. I think the next step in building a framework for your life is to audit the context. I learned pretty early on that leadership is contextual, and what you do and how you do it is largely determined by the circumstances you're in. When I first came to Southeastern as president, our university was two enrollment cycles away from really shutting its doors. Two years prior, it had been a campus swelling with over 3,000 students, led by a dynamic, charismatic leader. But after two years with no leadership, Southeastern was down by almost 1,000 students and shrinking. And I knew right off the bat that we had to do something to change the context of the university. And that meant not only taking the time to listen to the people, but look to understand what are the factors affecting the situation. Auditing the context means understanding the urgent issues that matter to your people and innovating ways to meet those needs. 
As leaders, we must always remember we're not leading assets, we're leading people. And as I begin to listen to the people, I begin to understand the urgent issues that matter to them. From auditing the context of the university, I saw what our people were good at. And, and then I also saw what they didn't have and what they needed um, and, uh, and, and how they can approach, you know, the, the, the slow march to, you know, a way to make this university healthy and, and strong again. Um, that season of auditing our context made it readily apparent that what our university needed to climb out of enrollment decline was a lot of um, need-oriented education or need-oriented programs. A uh, couple of things that we found out that, um, you know, met those issues and really felt could propel the university to, to growth and health was to start a football program, to start a nursing program. While those two things may not seem all that revolutionary in the context of SEU, which began as a small, you know, Bible teaching school for pastors in the middle of an orange grove, football and nursing, you know, absolutely revolutionary. Naturally, there was, you know, there were a lot of people that kind of resisted to some of these ideas. Many people thought that by bringing these two programs online, we were fundamentally changing who we were as a community. But because we had started this change process by listening to our people, and then we developed these initiatives through auditing our context, we were able to meet that resistance head on by demonstrating this was the best decision for our community. And through our framework, we were able to take control of our context. What I want everyone to learn from my experience is that leadership is contextual. If you will take the time, have the patience to audit that context, then the road ahead will always be clear. I think another step in building a great framework for your life uh, and legacy is to clarify your goals. What I hope everyone learns from my legacy is that you will never accomplish anything great if you don't have clarified goals. I think the biggest threat to your life is not external competition or shifts in the marketplace or even failing at trying something new. The biggest threat to your life is when your mission gets blurred and you're not right on target. You know, I will never forget one of my first days on the job as president of SEU. I was right in the middle of conducting one of the most extensive listening exercises the university had ever performed. And after weeks of interviews and surveys, I, I had to get out into the campus and just take a walk around. As I was going through the campus, I made you know my way to one of the many garden beds around. Beautiful. If you've seen our campus, just beautiful. It looks like a resort. And I saw one, one of our groundskeepers working in one of the gardens, and I stopped him and, and I said, Hey, you know, I just want to let you know, thank you for the incredible work you're doing, keeping our campus looking beautiful. Um, he said, well, that's really not, you know, he thanked me, but he says, that's really not my job. He said, my job is I'm, I'm actually helping give students a world-class education. You can see this kind of clarity of goals in the words of, of, of that groundskeeper. He understood everything he did was a part of giving our students a world-class education that integrated faith, learning, and life. For him, the goal was clear. He may have had a particular job in that organization, but he understood what the goal was for every student that um, uh, uh, was accepted and attended at SEU. Um, it unified his actions with our community. Clarity brings unity for leadership. After listening to the people and auditing the context, we had a pretty good idea of the urgent issues we needed to tackle, as well as the culture we wanted to create. Those frameworks were already moving the needle you know, for our organization uh, to growth and health, but everyone was beginning to run in different directions. So what we needed, you know, were clear goals, a functional framework that would guide all of our actions and unify our efforts. So we did. We developed actually a functional framework around the goals of affordability and accessibility. We recognize that everything we do needs to unify around the goal of creating affordable and accessible education. And I think once we clarified, you know, those two goals, everything began to change at our university. The team now had clear intentions to unify around, and people who were very different regarding, you know, the gifts and their personalities begin to collaborate and innovate together in a way that, you know, would bring change. What will you accomplish when your goals are clear? Wow, I mean, that's a great question. And what I've realized in my life and what I hope people pick up from my legacy is that when you are clear on the goals for your life, there's nothing absolutely nothing that will hold you back from what God wants to do. 
I think the final step in developing a framework for your life is to achieve visionary alignment with the people around you. Legacy isn't owned by one person. A legacy is created through the network of relationships that we all share. What I hope to leave behind through my leadership is this idea of being a good steward of your relationships. None of us do this life alone. We are all part of a network of connections that inform how you think, show you how to act, and empower you on your journey of self-discovery. I want to be remembered as a person who stewarded the connections of my life well. What I've discovered through my experience is that when I steward and serve the people around me, all of a sudden conflict reduces and everyone begins to align around a common vision. After so many years of planning and preparing, the day of our first football game finally came. We had listened to our people. We had audited the context. We had clarified the goals. And now we had the chance to sit back and enjoy what we worked so hard to build. And it was an incredible day. For a school that had never had a football team, you would have thought we'd been doing football for years. Everybody was working together from the athletes to the coaches to the game day experience team. There was complete alignment across the board. If you've ever been to any kind of collegiate sporting event, you know what it feels like to experience the energy of a crowd of students cheering on you know, the team. It's addicting, watching the team move in perfect alignment, having the crowd cheering them on, you know, willing them into the next touchdown. Psychologist calls this the effect flow. And that inaugural football game, our team reached this state of flow. And looking at them on the field, they seem to be operating almost as a single unit, as if no real thought were involved. And you see, alignment is the final step in the process of developing a framework of legacy for your life. The principal benefit of good alignment, of course, is that it brings about a sense of flow, an environment where people are operating at high capacity with, without need for lots of managing or instructing. This is the way we know our frameworks have be, you know, begun to take shape when we experience this state of flow. An aligned organization doesn't have to figure out how to respond, it just responds. It can be tempting to ignore, I think, this final step takes effort to create alignment with the people around you but I've you know what I've learned is that the alignment is the is the moment when your framework becomes real your legacy has to be more than a good story it has to be lived out by everyone you touch everyone that you leave behind I want my life and legacy to be marked by people as I started off that you know at the beginning I I, I want to rem- I want to be remembered by the fact that Um, I helped every person I came in contact with discover who God has made them to be. The only way to do that is through a framework. Only by listening, auditing, clarifying, aligning can you accomplish the mission that God has placed on your life. There's one quote that has defined my life and I hope will define my legacy is, uh, is the quote that comes from the American theologian Frederick Buechner. He says this, he says, the place where God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger coincide. The place where God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger coincide. Basically, they come together. I want to help people discover that place where their specific passions can meet the world's unique needs. The only way they can do this is by learning how to create a framework for their life and having the discipline to live that framework out. I want to end with this story, and I love this story about the famous pilot Chuck Yeager. You know, when Chuck Yeager broke the sound barrier in his Bell X-1 on October 14, 1947, no hard engineering data existed on the flight characteristics of an aircraft traveling at supersonic speeds. Some thought it was possible that no aircraft could physically withstand the buffeting that would occur as it approached supersonic speed. Captain Yeager was literally flying into the unknown at more than 1,100 feet per second. Well, how did he do it? How did he fly his plane into the unknown? He did it through a framework. Experienced pilots have a mantra, fly the airplane. That's their mantra. And what they mean by this is that no matter what happens during a flight, there are certain physical principles that govern an aircraft's behavior. The 
pilot's job is to engage those principles as effectively as possible, no matter what else is going on, until the aircraft is safely back on the ground. And if you get into a patch of rough air, fly the airplane until the things smooth out. If an engine cuts out, fly the airplane until you can find a place to land. And Jaeger did just that. He trusted his framework and kept flying the plane. By the 1950s, uh, aircraft were routinely flying faster you know, than the speed of sound. And by the 1970s, the Concorde was carrying passengers across the Atlantic at supersonic speeds. If you can learn how to build a framework for your life, you'll never be lost even when you venture into the unknown. Well, when I think of legacy, I want my legacy to be that I kept flying the plane trusting the framework of my life into the unknown that God has called me to go. My hope is that as I do that, other people will be inspired to discover and live in the divine design of their own lives. Everything that we see, touch, and feel was created by God. The world is God's world, and every living creature is God's including each of us. Yes, God gifted us our lives and how we use them and how we steward them is our gift to God. And God so wants us to be good stewards. He so wants us to take good care of all his gifts. He wants us to be good stewards of our bodies and our health, of our minds and our hearts, of all the resources and gifts and talents that he's bestowed upon us. God wants us to steward the relationships and connections in our lives too, to love and serve everyone. By becoming good stewards of all of God's wonderful gifts, we show him how much we love him and how thankful and grateful we are for all that he's given us. This week on Relentless Hope, Dr. Kent Engel, president of Southeastern University, taught us all about becoming good stewards of our lives and why it's so important. As Kent explained, God has placed a divine design in everyone's hearts, and he intended for us to live amazing lives that give us a sense of meaning and purpose while also drawing attention to God's grace and love. In part one, our life segment, Dr. Kent Engel explains how we can't fulfill God's divine destiny for us without first becoming good stewards of our lives. Everything in life is interconnected. So if we allow bad habits and faulty thinking to take control of our lives, then we will mismanage the gifts that God has given to us. And if we mismanage our own lives, then we won't be able to serve God the way he intended. In part two, our leadership segment, Kent taught us about the power of self-discipline, and he shared some of the most effective disciplines we can create in our lives to become better stewards and better leaders, such as the disciplines of self-awareness, self-management, self-preparedness, relationship building, generosity, learning, and missional living. In part three, our legacy segment, we learned Kent's powerful four-step framework to help us become good stewards of our lives and our legacies. When it comes to leaving his own legacy, Kent shared how he's also passionate about being remembered for delivering the message that God uniquely made, created, and wired everyone to do something special. As Kent explained, everybody carries within them the imprint of God. Just as God is creative, we are creative. Just as God has a story to tell, we have a story to tell. And we're put on this earth 
to make a difference, to make a difference in this world, in other people's lives, and to live God's divine design for our lives. This means we must do our very best at the stewardship of our lives. By taking care of our lives, we take care of God's precious creation, and we set up ourselves to better fulfill God's plan and purpose for our lives. Everything in this world is a gift from God. Everything matters. Everything is meaningful. Everything deserves our respect, protection, love, and care. It's through our great stewardship of life that we show God just how much we love, respect, and care for Him too. The one principle that surrounds everything else is that of stewardship, that we are the managers of everything that God has given to us. And if you feel that we've given to you an inspirational episode of this podcast today on Relentless Hope, I want you to give it to someone else. So if you've enjoyed this podcast, please share it with someone you love. Remember, you have the opportunity to give hope a voice.